What If the Len Bias Story, hosted by Jordan Ritter Kahn, is the Ringer's latest narrative podcast. Episodes one and two launch on June 9th, and you can find new episodes every Wednesday on the Book of Basketball 2.0 feed. Here's a quick trailer. You've heard his name, Len Bias, 1980s phenom, second pick in the NBA draft. And then, cocaine, tragedy, one of the most shocking deaths in sports history. 35 years later, Bias's legacy is still making an impact. From Spotify and the Ringer Podcast Network, this is What If, the Lynn Bias story. I'm Jordan Ritter Khan. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July, I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023, I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRigger.com and joining me on the other line, it's Kate Winslet! God, I mean, I <laughs> happily step down. I happily give up my my position here on this podcast. We're in a long form agreement right now. We're just working out the kinks with Kate Winslet for her to replace Andy. So this is uh, Andy's last show. I mean, by the way, what an honor. You know, I, I I feel like she will have a more successful tenure than the dude replacing Mike Krzyzewski will. You know what I mean? Just oh, in terms John of Shire. A, You're really up to date on your sports legend. headlines. Hi, congratulations. Thank That's you. That's good. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, we should, because look, we are generally either above or way below self-promotion, but we should say that Kate Winslet was on our pod again. Yeah, on this week over here at Watch Industries. We had, so obviously Sunday night, we went live with our Brad Inglesby interview that went up after the Mayor of Easttown finale and also included our thoughts on the Mayor of Easttown finale. And then Tuesday, I guess, we had an interview with Kate Winslet where she talked beautifully and like just so it was just so moving in her description of like the her relationship to the character and her work mm-hmm. on the show. So that was awesome. So that's Tuesday. It, we it's also, the type of talk and candor you only get from a star when she's talking to the host of her favorite podcast. That's right. I think that that's the takeaway. <laughs> that's right. Uh, on Wednesday, Andy and I also recorded an interview with Eric Rochant, who is the creator, showrunner, writer of The Bureau, which we have been chronicling over the last couple of weeks. So we're going to get that last edition of our Bureau Deep Watch out uh, next week, probably. And that includes an hour-long chat with Eric Rochant, which was really awesome. In and fluent French, by the way. I was impressed with us. We just kind of locked in. It all came back to me. You know, I thought <laughs> it basically crashed out of seventh grade French, but, you know, yeah. all of a sudden. And it was then, weird that Chris only responded and asked questions using quotes from Le Petit Prince. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it is a French treasure, so I think Eric was okay with it. Madame Bovary over here. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Uh, and good that, now today is today. Uh, it's Thursday. This will go up Thursday night, uh, early Friday. And we were talking about Top Chef and a couple other things. One of the couple other things I want to do, um, I just want to jump in here because I almost forgot to do it, uh, to mention it the other day. I, maybe Kate wouldn't have known because I think she's a more recent convert to our podcast. But some people may have seen there was a YouGov poll going around that people were having fun with on the internet. That was basically like the wild animals that men and women feel that they could take down if they needed to in the wild. And my main takeaway from this was humans are dumb and I can't believe we've made it this far because humans cannot defeat animals. It's incredible that we've done this well. And I 
think it's mostly due to thumbs, not brains. So that's my takeaway. But I saw our friend, friend of the pod, um, who will hopefully come back on again to talk Top Chef with us, Mina. Mm -hmm. Mina Kimes was on one of her ESPN shows and talking about this and was basically like, I think maybe I could do a grizzly bear. And the other dude was like, yeah, grizzly bear. And I wanted to say, our producer, Kaya McMullen, has yeah. done this. She is not an abstract concept. Kaya, you are the you you are the exception that proves the rule that these people can't do what you've done. And I just feel like you should get more credit for this. You led the women who can take down or at least stare down bears uh, movement. <laughs> and congratulations. We're proud of you. Take your bow, Kaya. Um, thanks. I don't know if I want to take that much credit. And also, I'd like to make a point that grizzly bears are very different than like your brown bear because grizzly bears are really aggressive. Yeah. I would never come anywhere near a grizzly bear. I would just, if it had been a grizzly bear, I would have just given it my campsite. Kaya, I, you know, <laughs> Andrew, not that Andrew. I can tell the difference, but <laughs> not to, not to open up the curtain too much, but Kaya, Kaya's neighbors have construction going right now. So yeah. when Kaya turns her mic on, it sounds like she is in T2 right after Judgment Day has happened. There's like sirens in the background and jackhammering. I also live like two blocks from a hospital. So you just a lot of, a lot of noise. What's good is that because, Kaya, you live closer to the coast, like I imagine the Skynet takeover will begin there and work its way towards us. So holy mm -hmm. shit, there's just a giant spider here. One second. Oh my Wait, god. What's happening? There's like a fucking tarantula on my wall. One second. Can you take down the spider? Let's keep this. this I think this podcast is falling apart. This podcast is thriving. Kaya, um, we're still rolling. I just hope something I hope we hear Chris scream or something. I, I just I, I just want to say that I think that my answer to this entire thing, which is I want no smoke with any animal, is secretly the winning argument. No, I, I think that's your safest bet. And especially, especially since I just established just, to our listenership that I don't know. I didn't know there were different kinds of bears. And also, I think the spider has taken over Chris's uh, hosting. Uh, the Watch podcast hosted by Kate Winslet <laughs> and a giant spider. Okay. Uh, that was bold. Okay. Um, so on next week's edition of Wild Kingdom yeah. with Kaya and Kate. Right. Because um, I'll be dead from <laughs> tarantula mm -hmm. bites and Andy will be doing whatever he's doing. Um. Let's get through some news before. Well, yeah, actually, well, you know, you, you. I had a thing. Andy, you wanted to talk, talk a little bit more about Mayor of Easttown because we were not done with that. I know. Most people think we would be. We're not quite. I wanted to do a couple, run through a couple post mayor finale thoughts, questions for you, some of which were culled, harvested, if you will, from our Facebook group, which has been very active uh, on the subject of Mayor of Easttown. And so the first question that I had that I saw on there that I thought we could answer pretty easily was someone, or maybe this was over Twitter, someone cracked the case and realized that we had seen the finale before Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, a few days before Sunday, we recorded with Brad, I think last Thursday. Um, and someone was basically like, can you talk about what that was like seeing it early before other people? I imagine not like from a perspective of, oh, did you want to tell everyone, which is not the case, right. but just did it affect our, our viewing experience and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think that, it was it was suboptimal because I like watching it with everybody else. You know, I mean, obviously there was like the HBO Max outage that happened um, on Sunday night. So mm -hmm. I think that that would have been frustrating. But those things are always strange. You know, I actually find just like now that like movie theaters are starting to open again. And, I, you know, you and I are such like sort of advocates for the communal watching experience on TV in general that like it's always kind of odd to like watch something on like a Wednesday mid morning and then just like amble around and be like, I know what happens in Mayor of Easttown. Like, I, I don't mean to make it sound like it's not cool. It's very cool to watch it early, but it's also just kind of like, you basically like, you're like, oh, what did you do today? I watched Mayor of Easttown. Don't fucking say anything. Yeah. Don't even yeah, blink. It, yeah. It, it doesn't make you cool. It makes you a pariah because people think it's just going to leech out of you or something. Right. The, the truth or the secrets. Um, and I think other people don't trust themselves being around someone who has access to spoilers. I'll say just to, to two points. One, to sort of support what Chris was saying about the communal experience, our pals at HBO, after we loved the first two episodes, sent it to us. Like we, they sent us the whole series and we did not watch it. We did not watch ahead because we did not want to watch screeners. We did not want to watch ahead. And, 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 I, and I have to say, I was the only downside to watching the screener ahead of our interview with Brad was, it was, I loved watching it on my couch, on my TV. Like that actually was a more pleasant experience and mm -hmm. I, I was looking forward to it. I think that, I, I don't, you know, obviously people heard us. I love the finale. 
I actually think it had a higher bar to climb because of the context. You know, I was, in some ways, I am predisposed to to like things less, I think, when I watch them on my laptop or whatever. And so I, the fact yeah. that I was as emotionally engaged and moved, I think, spoke to how, how much it spoke to me. The other piece of, I think, that, that's built into the question, um, or at least it's a p- way to pivot into the second question, which was, when you watch something early, as Chris and I did, and this has happened to us on other finales or other major episodes of shows, you know, when we were doing the Game of Thrones show too, you can't predict what audiences are going to, mm-hmm. well, you can't predict what they're going to think big picture, but you also can't predict what they're going to harp on. Like what are the things that are working and what are the things that are not working for certain segments of the audience? And that's kind of a segue to say that the the biggest nitpicked that I've seen has been about the timeline of Mr. Carroll's handgun and yep. when it was missing and when it was reported. I don't know if you had thoughts on this. I just wanted to say that the episode addressed Mr. Carroll's uh, dementia. increasing dementia, right. also his grief and his disorganized state. That was enough for me. I also, though, did want to just use it as an opportunity to pivot to say that like, I don't like watching TV that way. Mm-hmm. I don't like watching mystery shows as if I am myself a detective investigating it. Yeah, um, yeah. The the emotional storytelling was so powerful that I didn't spend a moment trying to, you know, be the uh, internal affairs detective following Mayor's footsteps. That I did not bump on that. I understand I that the stuff, people who so, are yeah. Peaking. Let me let me just say I think that stuff can be really fun, and that is an aspect of like watching it together. Is that people start to be like, you know, I don't know. They had that one shot mm-hmm. of Lori, or they had that one shot of John, or then there's like that moment where. Uh, Father Dan seems to like link camera lingers on him. Maybe it's mm-hmm. him. Maybe it's this. I have a theory that it's like this. And that was like very fun during True Detective for the first season. Like that was mind blowing in a lot of ways. I, I think a lot of people were exposed to a lot of things that they had no idea about, like whether it's Lovecraft or whether it was just like doing all this research about what Carcosa is. Mm-hmm. But I could probably name on two hands and I can't name them off the top of my head. But if I actually give it some thought, the amount of times where I've seen a crime thriller or detective show or detective movie or even read a, a novel where I've been like, this case is completely watertight. Like the way that the, like the story makes complete and total sense. And I was surprised. It's yeah. happened like a couple of times, you know, most show like you, what you should aspire to be is the big sleep where it's so good. It doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense. And I think that there are parts of that that can be, well, it's just really complicated and they threw a lot of stuff at it. And there are some times where it's like, you know, obviously maybe something didn't go right on set or maybe something didn't go right in the production mm-hmm. or in the post-production and they didn't pull it off, quote unquote. But for me, like these crime shows are the ultimate Trojan horse for me because they wind up being able to tell stories that I think ordinarily mm-hmm. you wouldn't get to tell a story about a group of women living in a town in East town and dealing with issues of addiction and mental health and sort of communal disillusionment. You know, I mean, they, I just don't think that they, those kinds of shows get greenlit. I don't know that they ever have for the most part. I mean, even the David Simon shows that deal with things like that, they always have to have like some other thrust to them. Mm-hmm. So I guess my, my point is like, get used to it. Like, you know, like I, I know that serial has kind of changed all of that and like made us all feel participatory in like justice or solving cases or, or like, you know, if I just Google hard enough, I can figure this out. And I, I, I do acknowledge how fun that can be at times, but I also just think that like, you're kind of missing the point and very few of these stories actually strive for complete and total coherence and elegance. I think that's well said, and I agree. There, there was another post someone put up basically being like, I'm I'm really having trouble here because DJ would have been eligible for his ear tube surgery due to Pennsylvania's expansion of the Medicaid laws. And I was like, you're lost. Yeah. You know, you're, you, we're losing you. Like that's, no writer who can, who can give you the emotional weight of DJ as an, not even as a character, as an idea in this broken world should be spending time worried, about, thinking yeah, I mean, about how the Pennsylvania said, legislature has done... I should mention that I am on the last page of writing my great American novel. Mm. Uh, and I, I just don't know if I, by the I have to, I'm just w- waiting to find out what happens with infrastructure. Cause a lot of it is infrastructure yeah, yeah. dependent. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of roads and bridges 
in this novel. When you whiteboard your novel, do you have a cinema path and a mansion path? And like, you're just kind of, um, the analogy I would use that is probably more relevant to our Top Chef discussion that's coming up is- This is quite a, what a segue. Well, we still have one other thing on the merit topic and one other bit of news, but it was in my head. Um, We should be more honest about how we cover restaurants and food. And it's similar to the way we cover genre shows, which is to say, no one really remembers the food. It's if you're if you're being honest about a special occasion, special meal, night out at a fancy restaurant. I'm going to use the same two hands Chris counted on earlier mm-hmm. um, for the number of actual dishes I can remember, even from restaurants when I would go to restaurants more often in a pre-pandemic time. What I remember is the ambiance, the service, the room, the company, the occasion, the vibe, and that is relevant here. I think. You know what I mean? I, I, I generally, unless it's a disastrous, disastrously cooked piece of fish or something, I'm not going to say that, oh, I think the, the sauce on the snapper was a little too acidic. Like, mm-hmm. that's not my takeaway, especially if you get the wine pairing. You know I, what I mean? I, like, I, I hate to inform you. I don't know that you'll ever become a top chef judge if you continue to think that way. <laughs> well, that's, but that's different. That's not a night out at a restaurant. Can you imagine if Padma was like, Andy, what do you think? And you were just like, the vibes were immaculate, man. The Japanese <laughs> garden is beautiful. Uh, we'll get to that. So, okay. So then um, I guess the last point was, you know, I, I think pivoting forward, right? Looking ahead mm-hmm. to our post mayor landscape yeah. and how we feel about it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You mentioned uh, it's nobody cares about whether we have access to screeners or not, but like one of the sort of uh, choices you have to make when you do get a couple of episodes. And I think everybody makes when they get a Netflix show or an Amazon show or anything where they can binge it mm-hmm. is do I want, especially if you love it, do I want to go all in right now or do I want to like kind of taper it and and give myself a little treat every week and kind of like be the master of my own of my own programming schedule and one of the reasons why I didn't want to burn through mirrors I wanted to make it last longer I wanted it to last yeah. nearly 2 months you know I wanted to kind of like be a part of 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 people you know getting to know it and getting to love it and and talking about it so that's why I I extended it and I also extended it cuz I looked at the metacritic tv release schedule and I was like oh a <laughs> little bit of a gap here, you know, a little bit of a gap. Now there's, there's interesting shit coming out, but a little bit of a gap in that. I think the reason why we also freaked out about Mero is that we had our Sunday night story. You know, we had, we had our, like everybody kind of like, Oh, I can't wait for mayor. It's almost time for mayor. Mayor's over. Let's start chatting about mayor. Let's look and see what people said about mayor on Twitter. That's a, still like, I still just get such a kick out of that right now. If you look at like what's coming out in the next couple of weeks, there's a couple of things I'm really interested in. Sweet Tooth is something that I think we'll probably talk about on Monday, Andy, that you yeah, mentioned interesting. being really compelled. But can you give people a little bit of a background on that? I, I can't give you much. I know that um, Jeff Lemire, who's a really talented comic book writer and artist and influential the last few years, particularly with some of his um, creator-owned work, which Sweet Tooth is, this is an adaptation of that comic, which is a, about a post-viral pandemic world. So should be fun, uh, that I think has produced uh, human-animal hybrids. Um, I don't know how Kaya would fare against them Mm -hmm. in an open field, but I'm sure we'll cover that in future episodes. And, you know, it's sort of, in some ways, at least from its trailer, I don't know anything more than that. I did not read the comic books. Um, Getting some, like, lone wolf and cubs, which is to say Mandalorian vibes of a, a small boy with antlers being escorted across a difficult and unfamiliar universe and terrain. The other compelling thing about it to me is that it was show run by Jim Mickle who created or ran a show called uh, Happ and Leonard, mm-hmm. which was a really fun, slightly underseen, definitely undercovered even by us uh, genre show. And the idea of someone who is familiar with that world coming to the comic book IP dystopian universe, I think that's that's compelling. And plus, yeah. it'll be interesting. And I have to give a shout out to Briar Patch writer Haley Harris, who was on the staff of it. Um, nice. So I'm excited. I am excited about that. Yeah. Um, but Quick, just quick interjection uh-huh. before we even go further in the Metacritic stuff. I'm hoping that, you know, I referred to our pals at HBO. I would love to know from them if they would tell us directly if there is a uniquely, if there is a halo effect that is unique to the HBO Max, HBO slash HBO Max model that they will now see with Mayor. Because there is definitely is, to your point, Chris, a segment, a not insubstantial segment of the TV viewing audience that won't commit until they know how it goes or until it's all there for them to watch in the way that they prefer, which is sure. the opposite of the way you prefer, which is binging. Sure. I wonder, and, and so just and anecdotally, like you see people on Twitter now being like, 
I'm okay, fine. I'm starting or like I'm, I'm into it or, you know, that was a MSNBC's Chris Hayes this morning was like, boy, that was a good pilot or Jamel Hill yesterday was like, I'm on episode three. So people are doing this at their own time. And I wonder if there's anything in the data that they have now that says we're getting the best of both worlds. We're mm -hmm. getting that week to week. I mean, four million people watched uh, the finale. I don't know exactly across what metrics or despite the outages, how that works. But are they also going to get four million more? Yeah. I mean, do they get to have it both ways? That'll be do, interesting. Will, will now, it get a bump when there is an inevitable awards rush for it? Which totally. Which is probably bound to be, happen. And, you know, I was chatting with a friend yesterday about this, about, you know, everybody we ask, we ask Brad, I think, you know, like, would you do more? Would you do more? Everybody's asking. Mm -hmm. You can't really probably get somebody like Kate Winslet to move to Philadelphia for six months every year to make a long running cop show like that. Prop that time passed a long time ago. I don't you never could. You probably never could. Just in the same way, you probably couldn't get Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman to sign up to do Big Little Lies indefinitely. But what happened with Big Little Lies is that they got that massive star power and a really yep. compelling show. And their public reception of it was such that they did more. And I do think when you see the numbers for Mare, it, it, would, it would actually surprise me more if they never did it again. Now, yes. maybe it doesn't I come back for another couple of years or something. And maybe maybe... I have no idea like what, what approach they might take, but Brad Inglesby is a grinder. Like that guy, like writes stuff, and and even Kate said she's like that guy is just like a a real like he's pretty prolific, and I could see them doing this again in some capacity. What is your okay? If we set the I don't know anything about gambling, so correct me if I do this right. But if we set the the bar, set the whatever, set the line at four years, do you take the over or under? for under. not even the airing, under. but the commencement of Absolutely uh, under. You can listen to Kate Winslet talk about playing that part. I know it really like took a lot out of her, but I also think that it meant a lot to her. And I think mm. it means a lot, that part means a lot to other people. The question is whether or not you could find a story that would feel like yeah. organic and true. And I do, do think that they probably have enough respect for what they accomplished that they wouldn't want to screw that up. Can I set the line again? Can I be Vegas? Can yeah. I reset the line to 2.5 and take the over? So you think it's going to be like in three years, they might do it. Yeah, I think that the combination of obviously exhaustion, you know, the feeling of no matter how successful the experience was, they they got, I mean, anytime anyone makes something successful, they feel like they got away with one. I mm -hmm. mean, the longer it's been off the air, the halo of Watchmen grows. I mean, mm -hmm. as we learned this week with the national attention, the long overdue national attention on the the, the, the Tulsa race massacre and 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 and, you know, the president going there. That's not to say that that's because of the show, but I do think the increased attention from the show helped move things in that direction. And all of that to say, Damon, who's listening to this and hopefully nodding, was losing his mind. He was basically close to a nervous breakdown because he thought he hadn't gotten it right. You know, and so any, there's always that feeling if we got away with one. And I think that people want to like get as far away from the scene of the crime as possible for a while, mm -hmm. even when it is just excellent like this was. Um, I also think that um, Brad was going to be very busy. He's going to be very in demand. And sure. maybe there are other dream projects he has on the shelf that he wants to do and explore. And, and Kate is always in demand um, and rarely does things twice that aren't this podcast. You know, right. so right. only things that really we're still, motivate We're still her. waiting on Titanic, too. Uh, the other couple of things that I would mention uh, coming out soon, uh, Lysi's story or Lysi's story. I, I, sorry, I'm not familiar with the actual character's name and I didn't read the Stephen King book, but... Uh, written by Stephen King himself, directed by Pablo Lorraine, who directed Jackie, produced by J.J. Abrams. It's on Apple TV. It stars Julianne Moore and Clive Owen, Stephen King adaptation. It's, it's a nice little package. Yeah, so that has gotten mixed reviews, but I'm curious about it because King wrote it and because I'm curious to see how Lorraine approaches that and Julianne Moore and Clive Owen are good, great performers, so I'm, I want to check that out. And then the last thing I had on my list is like obviously Loki, which we'll, we'll get into next mm -hmm. week, is Betty's coming back. Very excited about that. Yeah. I, I, for people who don't know or remember, Betty was one of the absolute joys and surprises of TV last year. It definitely lifted me up during those dark early days of the pandemic, as opposed to the dark middle days and dark late days. It is, for people who don't know, it's it's sort of a loose evolution of uh, a, a film called Skate Kitchen and the Crystal Moselle made. Crystal came on the show last year to talk to me about Betty. And it's basically about young women in New York City skateboarding. 
And you think that sounds vague. It's actually a whole world and a whole vibe and a whole mood. And it's just delightful. And I'm so happy they were able to make another season of it. And uh, that's coming back soon. And I'll just keep banging the drum. It's six half-hour episodes the first mm-hmm. season. It's streaming now, HBO Max. It, it's such a nice thing to have waiting for you at the end of the day if you haven't seen it. Really loved it. And, I, you know, that that does seem to me... I mean, I'm curious. We haven't seen the new episodes. I don't know what kind of... It's the kind of show that doesn't need to take a leap. Like, it just keeps rolling. Um, so I don't know if that it's the kind of show that will merit week to week in terms of its dramatic serialization, but I'm so happy it'll be back in our lives and we will talk about it after we check out the first few episodes. For sure. Uh, Why don't we take a quick break and then we can get into Top Chef. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, I'm back with the Tofurky kid. Uh, we're here to talk about Top Chef. Um, Chris, I'm the Tofuti cutie. That, no, we agreed I, on that. So I missed last week's episode. Obviously, you did it with Juliet. Thank you so much to Juliet for filling in. Uh, I missed last week's Top Chef chat. Um, so this was, I'm back at it. Uh, we had. Can we just jump in and say, we're recording this early, screeners uh-huh. again. We have not watched Last Chance Kitchen, which seems like a doozy. So our whole conversation, not going to touch on Last Chance Kitchen. Yes, that's true. Okay. And I, you know, it, it's uh, it's tough because LCK is like, you know, becoming like a really important component to this show. Absolutely. I'm kind of surprised that they don't just like say, stay tuned for Last Can- Chance Kitchen next. Like, I know that it, it does digital stuff, but do you basically like this season, especially I'm like, these have been like pretty significant chefs in the competition. I, I yeah. kind of think that people would want to be able to get as much access to it as possible. But I guess if you love Top Chef, you just watch Last Chance Kitchen. What am I talking about? Anyway, so this uh, episode, you know, I think it, like just generally speaking, I just thought I would mention the lack of Portland in the show is mm. it's too bad. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I know that I don't want to harp on it or anything like that, but... Uh, I, and I'm not sure when they are shooting at this point in the season, like what time of year they're shooting. But, you know, they're doing outdoor competitions. It's beautiful. They obviously can't go to restaurants. They obviously can't interact with mass groups of people. It affected restaurant wars significantly. But um, it does feel like almost strangely, like just like a pure cooking show this year in a lot of mm. ways. Absolutely. Um, that said, I, I remain super impressed at the lengths they've gone to to make it feel rooted somewhere. And the two examples from this episode were, I mean, I didn't know that the country's oldest operating tofu factory is in Portland. They got mm-hmm. to visit it. That was cool. Yeah, the Japanese gardens are beautiful and they showcased are. what a beautiful place it is. Um, I agree with that. I, I, I have to say, I think, I, I mean, I think I you're think, right. I mean more people than I do places and things. You know what I mean? Like there's just yes, like, I, yeah. I think I think that for me, it is, they, they turned it into a positive and the the way it, you see that is just in the very human intimacy of the season. Um, part of that is the contestants themselves, you know, who are all who all just seem like super, very kind and generous to each other. They seem very fond of one another, very supportive of one another in ways that I like to see. That clearly the judges like to see. And you have that large judging table community that does somehow, despite quarantine restrictions, manage to grow and gain week to week. And because of that, it feels, I just think the word I would use is it feels more intimate. You know, I, I, you're right that we've lost the sense of place, but the humanity of all the people on display is more pronounced, or maybe there's just more focus on it um, than in previous seasons when we would have had to spend precious moments with learning about the guests or going to their restaurant, seeing how they operate. So I, I, I think that increasingly as this goes on, I, I mean, I, we said a few weeks ago, is this going to be an asterisk season? You know, the NBA yeah. bubble was not an asterisk season, but it kind of, you know, it will be thought of that way and talked about that way, sorry, right? Sorry, For Lakers fans. A lot of, sorry, Miami Heat fans, yeah, too, that's honestly. Who I would but actually, like, actually yeah. <laughs> But I don't really want to say sorry, Miami Heat fans. You're fine. <laughs> um, you live in Miami. It's okay. Uh, so, but I, in, anyway, I don't think that's the case. I think 
and we'll we'll see this more as the last few weeks unfold, and hopefully we'll get to talk to someone involved in the show before the season is over. Mm-hmm. I think that there are innovations that were that that were created out of crisis this season that will help the show going forward. Yeah, I actually think it's going to be seen as a rebirth in some ways of the show. I'm not sure. I can't remember historically. I've like I think they've also come up with some competitive innovations that I think are pretty fascinating, like um, the two step judging of the quick fire. I thought was cool. Um, yeah. just where they're cooking two meals for one judge who then pass that winner on to Richard who decides who wins. I thought it was really cool. And I thought tournament style tofu was, you know, so cool. I mean, it was an endurance race. It was also like, you know, how much effort or creativity are you putting into any one dish? Like, uh, there were a couple of chefs who obviously with the elimination were like, I don't plan on being here past <laughs> one dish. Like I think Shoda was like, I'm winning on my first one. Like I'm not, I'm yeah. not trying to like be here cooking tofu dessert after like braising this thing overnight you know this is this is i win but yeah like i think that you're right there's going to be a lot of innovations i'm curious what those innovations will do also and i thought i would start from sort of one of the most touching moments of last night's episode Mm -hmm. or this most recent night's episode uh and what we've been talking about a lot with the evolution of the show was Dawn's medical incident where she cuts herself mm-hmm. on a mandolin, which I've done so many times that my wife no longer lets me near it as a like a physical oh, yeah. object. And she's like, I need a medic. And then um, Byron and who else was in the competition? Maria. Byron and Maria help her finish her hot chicken style tofu. And she just comes up short by one dish. So is forced to go back into the dessert. But you've got basically like you know, you can eliminate Dawn right there. You can get, you can make mm-hmm. it a, a competition between two people if you just. Well, she's and, on a hot streak. Yes, I mean she's she's been she winning all of a sudden. Won multiple quick fires. So she's definitely on a hot streak. So yeah, like it's just sort of wild to think about that. Um, that, thought, that that's where the show is at, and even Padman remarks like that's that's beautiful that you guys did that. Yeah, I I, I think that this was a really in, this was first of all. Really entertaining episode. The bar is really high, and they're hitting it week to week to week. There have not been any duds. Um, the tournament style, which took the place of a judge's table, traditional elimination, winner, and elimination, I loved it. Gave us different energy, different vibe, different um, rhythm to the show, and also gave us more time cooking, You know, which may be one of the reasons why you were, you were focused on that and how mm-hmm. the show is, has evolved. You know, There just wasn't all the stew room and judge de- judges' deliberation time. It was just them cooking, 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 wire to wire. I also thought it was cool because the first half of the episode, the quick fire, as you said, interesting and compelling uh, presentation of the competition. I like that they were given uh, adjectives. I like that Tom and Gail were in the kitchen, uh, the quick fire kitchen. That said, it was a corporate shilling quick fire, um, which the show needs. Listen, I, you know, Chris, our listeners know I love capitalism, always here for the ads, but it's always a kind of a drag to me when they have to take that time being like, these are the fresh ingredients that this multinational corporation definitely uses every day, as opposed to saying, it's a Mexican pantry, let's go. Mm-hmm. What I loved though was, and please, you know, don't put words in anyone's mouth. This is me saying this. The second half of the episode felt like a massive subtweet at the first half where they were like, okay, we did the corporate thing. Now we're going to go to a hundred year old tofu factory and make them cook tofu, Mm -hmm. which was a wonderful corrective to the first half of the episode and led to moments of real creativity, really exceptional and surprising cooking. And to your point, just wonderful camaraderie. I I, I love seeing that. Yeah, I... I want to ask you a question. If you were cooking, and I'm, mm-hmm. I think we can just kind of jump around everywhere here because this is obviously an episode that's sort of, I, you know, once once we don't know what happens in Last Chance Kitchen, I assume whatever happens in Last Chance Kitchen is going to kind of set up the, the competition for the final three here. Mm-hmm. Um, the Dawn Byron thing at the end with dessert, mm-hmm. would you be more or less intimidated if you were one of the chefs and you found out that the other chef was essentially making the same dish would you be like this is great because if i just cook the best that i can i it'll be evaluated in kind of like an equal way because we're both making the same thing or would you be like fuck i would have made something else had i known this person was also going to do dried rehydrated mangoes with their soft tofu i'm gonna i'm gonna chicken out and basically say both. I think that if, if one was in the in the heat of competition, 
I think one's first reaction would definitely be to curse and be like, this sucks. I had three other ideas. I should have done that. But I think that with some distance and with the clock not running, you'd think, well, it's it's a perfectly even playing field. And I feel like that's something that they've done in Last Chance Kitchens before, where they're like, here are the six things, do this. And then Tom is just like, this one had better texture or whatever. Um, I, I thought that, and we can work backwards, but in terms of the, we, why don't we just start with the, since you mentioned it, let's start with the final thing, mm-hmm. the final battle. This was one of those moments when you'll never get them on the record. You can't prove it. I felt like they gave it to Dawn because Dawn has just been consistently better and like had a, been consistently better. Like a makeup better. call, kind of? Not even a makeup call, but just like they let the previous courses, including the hot chicken tofu, which they weren't officially judging. But they into were like, it. this is amazing. I'm, yeah. I mean, you looked at this, just look at what we saw from this episode in the tofu competition, right? I mean, the first two rounds evenly split. That was wild. Mm-hmm. That was wild that Maria tied Shota on tofu. After he after he just dunked on her with with what she claimed as her ingredients, mm-hmm. that was really impressive, and clearly the level of creativity and confidence with the to some unfamiliar ingredient was really um, compelling mm-hmm. and great. And Byron wasn't up to that bar. I mean, consistently he was the weakest across his three battles. Right, he lost nine to one, lost nine to one, and then made the same dish as Don. So. I just felt like this is one of those ones where we can't get in their heads, but I can't imagine anyone who's not related to Byron walking away from this episode being like, that was oh, the I wrong don't, I don't think it was unfair at all. I, I also think in a weird way, you know, like I, I, I think Dawn is my personal favorite. Like I'm, And, I'm and Juliet last week said that was her pick now to win. Dawn was her pick. But it's kind of amazing... I, I, you know, Dawn is somebody who's like, I think it, it's, it's strange. She doesn't strike me as the kind of person who's like, I'm just going to see what happens. You know, like yeah. I'm just going to have these right. ingredients and see what happens. So to watch her in an elimination uh, dessert challenge with a bleeding hand and just be like, uh, you know, like I'm going to make a cookie crumble and I'm going to do yeah. this. And meanwhile, Byron's like, this is exactly as I planned it. Here's what I'm going to do. Here is this. And Byron is just like methodically working through it. And Dawn has got like one hand up in the air as she's like making all this stuff. And then Dawn makes like an amazing dish. It's like she's got something to her, man. Absolutely. And here's the thing that I thought was so um, noteworthy about this elimination challenge. First of all, let me say, Byron just seems like the loveliest person. I wish him nothing but success in in Last Chance Kitchen and beyond. Like he, he was wonderful. Not just like as a human being and the emotion that he brought, but a good teammate and competitor and was so gracious at the end and clearly can cook his ass off. Mm-hmm. However, this was a really radical challenge for this late in the competition because as many of these people say, other than Shoda, none of them cook tofu on the reg. No. And this <laughs> would have... Maria Her- hilariously was like, I don't ever want to taste go tofu. Again. Right. <laughs> if you had done this challenge any of the first 10 seasons, I don't even know if you would have gotten something palatable. Mm -hmm. Byron would have done probably this well, if not better, in previous seasons because of his classical training and his, the way his mind works in the kitchen, as we've seen is, how can I filter this through the prism that I learned in the kitchens of many fine restaurants, including, I believe, 11 Madison Park in New York City, which, you know, now that he's left, has gone vegan, so maybe he would have had to do better with tofu. So he was doing classed up oat cuisine tofu preparations to the best of his ability. The rest of the chefs, whether because they work from a place of inspired creativity like Don, or as we learned, Don also has Japanese uh, culinary background because she worked at Uchi and Uchiko, the beloved restaurants in Texas, yep. which I, I don't think had been mentioned before. The rest of them work from a place of either cultural heritage, in, certainly with Shota, you know, sure. Who, was correctly confident that he could manage tofu because it's a central ingredient to Japanese cooking or from a place of, you know, like, like the cultural warm hug theory of dining where Maria was like, I'm going to bend this ingredient with my ingredients and it's just going to fold into itself because it'll be homey. and It'll be what I do. And they wouldn't have done a challenge like this years ago. I love that they did it. And as someone who cooks tofu a lot, it was cool. Yeah. It was actually exciting to see them not be like, I guess I'll just make a tasteless slab on a plate and maybe make a meat sauce next to it that they'll dip it in. Like they what, cooked it. What's your favorite tofu preparation? I, I've become fairly adept at a flavorful tofu stir fry because hmm. tofu is very popular with my children who are not vegetarian, but just really like it. Yeah. So 
yeah, marinating it kind of like what a lot of people did and then sort of hard sauteing it so you get like a nice crust on it. Yeah. But I also like to use it in in like Danabe dishes, like Japanese soups or stews where it's not really flavored, it's just texturally part of it. We marinate it and then sprinkle some cornstarch on it and bake it. Oh, nice. To get yeah, it, so like you get a little, little crust. A, a crust, yeah. And then we throw it in rice bowls and stuff. Yeah, but, but now, I, I, don't you want to make Nashville hot tofu? I, you know what? I'm not a... I, are you a hot chicken person? I don't like things that are hot, like just for the abusive nature of the heat. But I think that that I, the way that she prepared it, like, was kind of exciting because it seemed like she had, she managed to make like a really flavorful crust, and there was pickles and things. And then it would have been an interesting, almost creamy texture. I feel like that could have been cool. Yeah, I want her the, to make it. I don't want to try to do that. The, this, I remember when Danny Chow wrote an amazing piece about hot chicken and described like yes. some of its properties, like though basically like this is what ecstasy does. And I'm yeah, like, I'm not that guy. I don't know. Just like. I would never say do ecstasy, but like, <laughs> but then maybe that's more your speed. Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I mean, it would have been like twenty years ago, but I'm saying like I, I, I just would. I, I, I think I'm more like that is not what I'm looking for in a meal. Is to, to no be rolling. I, you know, I will say, and I don't know if it's due to the crushing emotional effects of the pandemic or just my aging and decaying taste buds. But the biggest surprise of the last year is I've become a spice guy. Like I will, I am now hot sauce on the table sure, person, me too. Yeah. which I didn't think I was. Well, I'm like that because I destroyed my palate with cigarettes. So now I need oh, like, I need like a shot of something just to like make anything come to life. But I am not a like thrill seeking endorphin chaser. Like, I don't think that's fun to be like, let's punish ourselves, you know, right? just so I can feel the tears, like finally get the tears flowing. You know what I mean? That's not, I'm not there. Any but, other um, big observations from this week's episode? You know, the, I like Ed Lee. I was glad he was on the mm-hmm. panel. I was glad Brooks coming back next week. I, you know, it's, it's, I'm sorry to say this. I didn't notice that people were being cycled out that Carrie and Amar are no longer around. Oh, and it's a Christian, um, Kristen's there and Brooke's going to be there now. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but that's cool. Keep it I fresh. Think, I think I would, I hope, this has been amazing. I think it's such an incredible like testament to the community of Top Chef that all these people made this kind of sacrifice and went into a bubble and everything. I do think that I prefer three judges with a, c- occasionally like a couple of yeah. different people coming I, in. But for the most part, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Padma, Tom, and Gail, although I think as a traditionalist, I prefer it that way. Yes. And like I think they actually have like the perfect three-person dynamic for that table. But there's like too much like constitutional Congress stuff going on. Like even last <laughs> night and them like being yeah. like, stand over here if you like no, this tofu. How about Kwame? Like, Kwame was like, we got to take this to the dojo. Yeah, that was just like, Incredible. that's that's actually like, it's kind of good TV, but I also feel like there's a purity and a like kind of, I think that the original conception of like how you judge that dish with three people makes sense. Yeah. You know, like two and a tiebreaker. It's just, it's just. No, that that's that's more pure. I agree. I I. I will, and I'll, I'll probably do this with a, with a more full-throated endorsement near the end of the season or after we see how this shakes out, but I will continue to advocate for something that I think I first started talking about in a Grantland piece in the season when Emeril was the fourth judge, mm-hmm. which was, I think that they should have mentors. I think that they should have people who are with them the whole season who are available to give advice or set up challenges or tour them through the neighborhoods like Kwame and Gregory did. And I think that they should pull from their incredibly robust, as we've learned, internal talent pool for that. Because I think that there is, you know, in the same way that like, a, you, you're loving my sports analogies today, so I'll just do one more. But like, Bring it on, serve it up. You know, in a, in a baseball clubhouse, like, uh, like hitting coach is mm-hmm. a place where recent players seem to set settle in because sure. I don't think it may, I don't know what that job is other than like, you know, offering people sunflowers and telling them to feel their quan. Like I don't, I don't really know. Maybe it's more complicated than that now. Yeah. But you know what I mean? It's more like they've done it. And so that's a resource. And it also, I think, makes the viewing experience better and more consistent and hel- and helps avoid the problem that, that existed that season when it was basically noobs versus veterans and the veterans uh-huh. wiped the floor with the noobs. And I yes. think Brooke ended up winning that season. So That was South Carolina. Yeah, when Brooke won. Um, I think we can wrap up there. A nice tight, tight 45 for us this week. We'll be back on Monday. And I think what we'll do is chat a little bit about Sweet Tooth and we'll have some other stuff to talk about. We'll have our last uh, bureau next week. And yeah, keep talking Top Chef. Keep talking all, all this other stuff. Loki's Loki. next week. Yeah, And then so. the week after, we'll start our Mayor Rewatch, right? That's right. <laughs> That's yeah, I mean, right. why not? It's working. 
<laughs> All right, man, I'm going to go find this spider. <laughs> Good luck with that. I'm sure Kate will enjoy his co-hosting abilities. Have a great weekend, Baranskis. <laughs>